The Arena Football League is returning. Quite frankly, this is another shocking rise for a sport that has suffered more peaks and valleys over the years than the Rocky Mountains. By peaks, we're talking about its PS2 game and the broadcasts on ABC, while valleys, well, we're referencing things like bankruptcy and letting KISS have carte blanche over the branding of a franchise. Ugh. Anyway... Slated to begin play in 2024, this is seemingly the umpteenth time an organization or a group of people have tried to make arena football a thing in America. Unsurprisingly, the group behind the latest incarnation of the AFL is dreaming pretty big. Anyone who has followed arena football for any amount of time over the years will be all too familiar with this over-the-top bravado and fluffy marketing speak. It is two parts fantasy, one part hyperbole, and just a little delusion sprinkled on top. The reality here is that any fleeting success will be followed by a decline that has derailed all previous attempts to make the sport quote unquote bigger and better as Rossi claims. Before I get into the story of the many rises and falls of arena football, I do want to give a special thank you to the YouTube creators that you see on your screen now. These users have preserved games, pieces, interviews. They're really the ones truly keeping the history of arena football alive, and I would like to thank them all for preserving this footage. With that out of the way, this is the story of arena football, folks. Arena football actually kicked off in the 1890s, although it is very important to provide some context to that statement. This was simply college football games being played indoors a phenomenon that was unheard of during this part of history. Perhaps the most famous of these indoor matchups featured Michigan facing off against the University of Chicago on Thanksgiving Day in 1896. Billed as the first ever collegiate game to be played inside, the matchup took place at the Chicago Coliseum, a venue that had no issues fitting a full-size football field under its roof. The first real attempt at arena football, at least as we sort of know it in present day, can be traced back to 1902 in Madison Square Garden for something called the World Series of Football. This was basically a total mess. For starters, this World Series was just a bunch of random teams. Secondly, the field itself, well, someone just brought a bunch of dirt into Madison Square Garden plopped it on the surface, it was sticky, it slowed everyone down, and it was just kind of a nightmare to play on. However, this was the first version of indoor football to introduce the concept of a shorter field. Some 30 years later, out of necessity, the NFL decided it wanted to give arena football a try in what has to be one of the oddest games in the league's history. For starters, this matchup played indoors between the Portsmouth Spartans, who would later go on to become the Detroit Lions, and the Chicago Bears was actually the NFL's first ever championship game. While there was a lot of excitement surrounding this, a massive snowstorm meant there weren't really any options to play it other than finding a solution that could host this contest inside. Chicago Stadium was selected to host the championship game, but its playing floor could only accommodate a 60-yard field with two 10-yard end zones, and the width was actually much, much smaller than a regulation football field. The field itself, well, that was comprised of bark. You know that stuff that's basically found in most jungle gyms and playgrounds across America. Uh, that bark was laid on top of dirt, which had been left by a circus who used the stadium before the NFL. Playing conditions were not great and things were made worse by a number of rule changes playing indoors necessitated. These included banning drop kicks and field goals. There was also a stipulation requiring the ball to be moved back 
20 yards when a team crossed their opponent's 10 yard line. It could best be described as a sideshow, although there were a few positives to emerge from this, the first NFL championship game. For example, hash marks were used here for the very first time and eventually would be incorporated to all NFL football fields. But yeah, at the end of the day, the Chicago Bears would win the very first instance of professional arena football by a score of 9-0. After that though, the sport would go into hibernation until the 1980s. In 1902, one of the very first indoor football games was played at Madison Square Garden as part of that World Series of Football. It's only fitting that nearly 80 years later, it would be the same venue that gave birth to the idea of modern arena football. An employee in the NFL office at the time just happened to catch an indoor soccer game being played at MSG and thought to himself, why not football? Right then and there, he took out a manila envelope and really just started jotting down some basic ideas and sketches of what the sport could be. Unfortunately, life got in the way of arena football becoming a reality, at least in the short term. Foster would take a job with the fledgling USFL and his day job took precedent over what he hoped could be another alternative to football. Of course, we all know what would happen to the USFL in the 1980s and Foster did find himself out of a job in a few years. That just happened to free him up to go all Ben Wyatt and dive headfirst into his crazy idea of arena football. By 1986, he was ready for a proof of concept game. That ended up going so well that a year later, he was ready for what he dubbed a showcase event for the sport. He pulled out all the stops to make this successful. The contest, it was played at the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago, and even ESPN was on hand to grab some footage that would later be used on its programming. Everyone left the showcase game thinking there was something there and efforts began to form a league shortly thereafter. Nearly four months after the showcase game had concluded, the Arena Football League kicked off with four franchises. You had the Pittsburgh Gladiators, Denver Dynamite, Washington Commandos, and Chicago Bruisers with the league being a six game schedule where the top two teams would eventually square off in the very first arena ball. The league's inaugural game actually drew 12,000 people to the Pittsburgh Civic Center. It was not, however, televised. AFL officials still uncertain of just how their sport would play out given that only two games had been played, really just wanted a dry test run to get a better idea of what it would look like. Satisfied with the results, indoor football was then showcased a few days later live on ESPN with Bob Rathbun and a pre-college game day Lee Corso on the call. A few other interesting names also were a part of that first season with the Arena Football League. Most notably, Marty Morningwig and Mike Stoops played in the league, and of course they would go on to have professional success in the football world as coaches later on. As for the games themselves, well, everything went okay, and a decision was made to run it back in 1988. It took all of a few months for the Arena Football League to be in existence before someone tried to copy it. The World Indoor Football League announced it would also begin play in 1988 with a few minor gameplay tweaks, perhaps the most notable of these being that the offense would have one extra player on the field at all times. It was never found out if that was a good idea or a bad one because the league never got off the ground. Teams started folding before the regular season kicked off and it just went nowhere. However, one of arena football's oddest trends can be traced back to this failed arena football league in 1988. Musician John Cougar Mellencamp was among the owners of the Indiana franchise. 
For whatever reason, musicians and rock stars have been drawn to indoor football ownership like moth to a flame, but this is something we'll explore a little bit more as the story progresses. Shortly after that first season ended, the Arena Football League commissioner and founder Jim Foster would apply for a patent which was granted in 1990. Now you'll see it widely reported that this was the first case of a sport being granted a permit, but that's a little misleading. Anyway, these early years of playing indoor football, it was more about building awareness for the sport itself more than anything else. Teams, while well, they came and went, and a lot of the games weren't played at home, but were part of this sort of traveling arena football roadshow that went from coast to coast. The hope of these sort of big arena football tours was that it would hopefully A, gain the sport a little more exposure, and B, find markets suitable for expansion. A regular season matchup between the Pittsburgh Gladiators and Chicago Bruisers being played in Sacramento's Arco Arena would end up being covered by national media, but not for the right reasons, however. Pittsburgh head coach Joe Herring punched the founder Jim Foster during an on-field altercation and someone just happened to get a photograph of the incident which was just about everywhere the next day. These 15 minutes of fame ultimately didn't help or hurt the AFL as a whole and it basically existed sort of on the fringes of the sporting landscape. Perhaps the most notable thing to happen in the AFL during these early years was the Miami Hooters franchise and that uh, may or may not be a good thing depending on how you view that brand. Apart from that, the league found three strong markets in Orlando, Tampa Bay, and Arizona. Occasionally they'd get a game broadcast on ESPN2, but mostly it just sort of played games, there were some fans, but it was a really, really sort of compact minor thing that had yet to gain any traction on a national scale. As the AFL moved into 1996 and 1997, it found itself on a little more stable footing. A few more reliable franchises had entered the fray, and some guy named Kurt Warner, well, he was tearing it up for the Iowa Barnstormers, although it would be a while before that would actually benefit the Arena Football League. The big thing that had happened during this time is Arena Football went from being this novelty or sideshow that sort of toured from town to town to being seen as an actual form of football. Not everyone liked it or even understood it, but it was definitely something by this point in time. So much so that the NFL even started keeping tabs on what the AFL was doing. And of course, having the Arena Bowl being broadcast on ABC in 1988 certainly helped. Earlier, we had mentioned that the commissioner and founder of the Arena Football League, Jim Foster, had patented the sport. Well, he claimed that his patent covered basically any form of indoor football. In reality, you can't patent the idea of playing football in a basketball or a hockey arena. That's just not how patents work. In 1997, the rival professional indoor football league was founded and promptly sued by the AFL for trademark infringement. As part of this case, the PIFL submitted a ton, a heap of evidence in discovery. So much, uh, in fact, that the AFL just decided to drop the lawsuit the very next day. Essentially, the actual patent only really covered the AFL's nets and what happened to the ball and the rules involved when it did hit the nets and the, the structure that holds the nets which was unique to the arena football league. There were a few other minor league specific rules that were covered under the patent as well but yeah it turns out Foster just you can't you can't actually patent an entire sport because it's just not something that's a trademark. The court case victory against the AFL would be the lone high in the PIFL's history. It played one season before splitting off into two rival leagues, both of which would fold. 
On January 31st, 1999, John Elway guided the Denver Broncos to a victory in Super Bowl 33. Less than two weeks later, the NFL announced it acquired an option to buy a 49.9% stake in the Arena Football League. This effort was spearheaded by a young Roger Goodell who framed it as a way for the league to make new fans. That logic is classic Goodell nonsense, by the way. People who were fans of indoor football or arena football, they were already likely to be NFL fans as well. I mean, Goodell may be clueless, but even he had to have known that. Instead, it really appears that this push was being driven by a few owners. For example, New Orleans Saints owner Tom Benson had agreed to acquire a AFL franchise in New Orleans. However, at that time, NFL rules stated that no owner may also have a ownership stake in a rival football league. That restriction was eventually removed by then NFL commissioner Paul Tagliabue and NFL owners were free to invest in AFL franchises. Several other owners did eventually purchase teams or the right to new franchises when that happened. This included Jerry Jones owning the Dallas Desperados, Pat Bullen being part owner of the Colorado Crush, William Clay Ford Jr., son of the Lions owner, taking a stake in the Detroit Fury, and Daniel Snyder purchasing the option for an expansion Arena Football League franchise. It must be noted that we are firmly on the dot-com bubble at this time. Money is just sloshing around America and everyone is looking for the next big investment. Then Kurt Warner happened. He became the poster child for arena football after his remarkable season with the St. Louis Rams in 1999. The free publicity and interest in arena football generated by Warner was simply staggering. It also came at a perfect time for the Arena Football League since it was in the market for more television partners. ESPN, ESPN2, and ABC were showing some of the games, but there was still more inventory available that the AFL wanted to get on national television sets. Enter TNN, which was desperate for really anything that helped it get away from its previous moniker of the Nashville Network. They were happy to have the rights to what appeared to be an ascending league. Not even an antitrust lawsuit at the start of 2000 could derail the league's momentum. The reality is these probably sound scarier than they actually were. The AFL and the players managed to get both of these issues settled pretty quickly and the league kicked off with no work stoppage in the year 2000. With all this money flowing in, the AFL decided it needed to start another league. Some may refer to this as a developmental league or a minor league, in reality, let's call it what it was, this was a cash grab. It must be said though, you can make a strong argument that AF2, the secondary league to the AFL, was over the long term more successful than its big brother. That's somewhat remarkable considering AF2 was really just created and launched as a way to block the rival Extreme Football League from starting play in the year 2000. In case you are wondering, this XFL had no relation to Vince McMahon's XFL, which was still in the planning stages at this juncture. Anyway, the AFL would purchase six of those XFL franchises, added another six more, and launched its minor league. A year later, the Orlando Predators would purchase the remains of the IFL or Indoor Football League with a few of those teams also being added to the AF2 fold. Between 2000 and 2009, the Secondary League had a pretty good run, all things considered. Sure, teams came and went much like the AFL, but when you look at the big picture of minor league arena football, the AF2 
had a good run. I mean, attendances were over 4,000 a game across the league. It was probably bigger than minor league arena football had any right to be. And then you had sides like the Spokane Shock, who were outdrawing teams in the AFL. Now, look, it must be said, there is absolutely nothing to do in Spokane. I, go Idaho Vandals, lived in the inland northwest around this time, and there's just absolutely nothing happening, which in many ways made it the perfect market for the AF2. Locals love the sport, and the team sold out 25 of its 32 games between 2006 and 2009. There were other success stories too. Green Bay and Oklahoma City proved to be really strong markets for arena football, and there were quite a few cities in the Midwest that really embraced the sport. That is the real legacy of AF2. It developed this loyalty and this following for arena football that trumped brand name, league recognition, any of that. This would actually be something that was very important for the entire survival of indoor football in the following decade. The AF2 may have allowed the Arena Football League to stop some rivals from forming, but there were still a few other leagues who were able to get up off the ground during the 2000s. The most successful of these was the National Indoor Football League, which ran from 2001 to 2008. It basically looked for markets that the AF2 wasn't in and just decided to set up shop there. That league did have a few famous alumni worth mentioning here. There was Buffalo Bills running back Fred Jackson and now current Green Bay Packers head coach Matt LaFleur who spent time playing for the NIFL. That said, it also had a bad habit of hemorrhaging teams. Some of these would leave for the AF2, but most simply made lateral moves to other indoor football startups. This group included United Indoor Football, the American Indoor Football Association, and World Indoor Football League. We should also highlight some of the other leagues that started play around this time. Both the American Professional Football League and Continental Indoor Football League were regional leagues that had relatively longish runs of 11 and 9 years respectively. There was also the Intense Football League, which granted Alaska its first ever professional football franchise. That league would merge with United Indoor Football after the 2008 season to form a new entity, this is something that we're going to put a pin in. Other leagues existed in the 2000s, but most of them weren't around long enough to mention. They all sort of had one or two unique rule quirks that in theory made them different. However, if you were just a casual fan and you happened to catch one of these games, you would basically know what was happening and what sport was being played. The AFL patent did, however, prevent them from using the nets Jim Foster created all those years ago. In hindsight, Arena Football, and the Arena Football League in particular, was a bubble between 2000 and 2008. There was a lot happening, but none of it was particularly sustainable or profitable. That is wild when you consider just how successful the league seemed to be on the surface. For example, the average attendance in the AFL between 2004 and 2008 was more than 12,000 people per game. Of course, we do need to mention this is announced attendance and not paid tickets, but it's still an impressive number nonetheless. AFL also had a pretty good television presence during a span. NBC was the league's broadcast partner between 2003 and 2005, ESPN and ABC took over once again in 2006. It was the type of coverage most non-Big Four sports could only dream of. And then there were the two Arena Football League video games published by EA Sports. I know these games are remembered fondly. They're not very good games as a whole. They, there's a nostalgia factor there for reasons I don't fully understand, but back then they were crap. Today they are crap. They're, they're bad games. However, having these AAA title PlayStation and Xbox games put out onto the market, it was huge in terms of credibility and marketability. 
Behind the scenes though, things were not going so well. Teams would filter in and out of the AFL like ships in the night. In the 2000s, there were a total of 12 expansion teams, 11 would fold, you had 8 relocations. It was not a great look. Meanwhile, the NFL never exercised its option to purchase that 49.9% stake in the AFL. No reason was ever really given as to why the NFL didn't want to buy, but the reality was if NFL owners could simply own the teams there, it didn't really need the NFL actually owning the league itself anymore. Things took a turn for the worse as the 2000s progressed and the league started tinkering with rules people kind of liked. John Elway, yes, that John Elway, decided he didn't like the Iron Man rule that required players to play both ways and introduced free substitutions in 2007. The following season, defensive rules were adjusted for, again, no, no rhyme or reason. They were just switched because someone at the highest level thought, why not? Then a bombshell dropped two days before Arena Bowl 22. AFL Commissioner David Baker suddenly retired. All the talk at the time was about how Baker had left the game in a good place and how there had been growth and that it was really primed to take a next step, but that was all smoke. In reality, Arena Bowl 22 was the AFL's last game. Well, sort of. Despite all the glowing talk of a healthy league, the financials were actually pretty dire. In late 2008, the AFL reached a tentative agreement to sell a million dollar stake in the league to Platinum Equity. The firm planned to create a centralized, single entity business model similar to what the MLS was running. Safe to say, that pitch was not well received. Tom Benson shut down his New Orleans voodoo franchise almost immediately after the plan was unveiled to owners. Ultimately, Platinum Equity did not buy a stake in the AFL and all hell broke loose. Rumors about the league possibly folding started popping up. Those were denied, but in December 2008, this was announced. Well, sometimes you've got to take a step back before you can take one forward. That's the approach the Arena Football League is trying to take. This past Monday, the league announcing it has suspended play for the upcoming 2009 season. League owners voting in favor of shutting it down during a conference call. The pause did little to help the situation overall. In August 2009, the AFL would go into bankruptcy. It owed approximately $14 million to creditors and had no means to pay this back. The arena football bubble of the 2000s had officially burst. It wasn't all bad news though. Your local GameStop likely had about 20 copies of the AFL games for PS2 in a bargain bin somewhere. They're probably still there if the store hasn't been closed yet. While its big brother was off fighting financial issues in 2009, the AF2 still took to the field that season. This would be an important development moving forward. Firstly, that league needed to dissolve itself since it was majority owned by the now bankrupt Arena Football League. When that was completed, nine sides from the one-time minor league would link up with six former AFL teams to form a new entity. This new group would go on to acquire all of the AFL's assets, branding, logos, Really, anything the league had was purchased by this new group during bankruptcy proceedings. That meant it could use everything from the name to the logo, all that good stuff, when it was launching its new league. Essentially, it looked like nothing had happened to the AFL. The new old AFL kicked off in 2010. Unfortunately, fans' interest overall in the sport had waned. Average attendance was down by nearly 5,000 people per game in 2010 when compared to 2008. ESPN had also decided it was done broadcasting the league's game, and the AFL only had one game a week that was broadcast on NFL Network on Friday nights. 
games were also available online via Ustream, which I had completely forgot was a thing until this very moment in time. Teams were coming and going at a pretty rapid pace, even by Arena Football League standards. Franchises were also changing their name for no reasons in particular. Everything the AFL did at this moment in time, it just seemed desperate. The most symbolic move of the league's desperation at this time had to have been selling league title sponsorship rights to Net10, a mobile operator who was owned by TrackPhone. The Net10 Wireless Arena Football League did not have a great ring to it. Uh, as bad as that pun was and as bad as that name was, Arena Football had not hit rock bottom yet. Musicians have been oddly synonymous with Arena Football over the years. We mentioned John Cougar Mellencamp being involved with an Indiana franchise as part of a startup league back in the 1980s. Uh, there was also Tim McGraw, who was a part owner of the Nashville Cats in the 2000s. However, the most high-profile partnership had to have been John Bon Jovi and the Philadelphia Soul, with his ownership stake even being used in the plot of an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You are interested in buying our arena football team. Big time. Mm -hmm. But I want to do business with Mr. Bon Jovi himself. Bon Jovi. Yeah. Mr. Bovine Joni himself. I'm offering $40 million for the team. This trend just completely jumped the shark when KISS bandmates Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley were granted an expansion AFL franchise. This was a move destined to fail from day one. You can't even classify this as a Hail Mary because a Hail Mary has a small percentage of working out. KISS owning an arena football team was never, ever going to work. Proof of that could have been found 15 years previously when World Championship Wrestling tried to bring in KISS to lift sagging ratings and declining attendances. They brought in the band for a televised performance as well as launching a KISS-inspired wrestler dubbed The Demon in 1999. It was somehow worse than that sounds. The entire partnership between KISS and WCW was a disaster. KISS fans had zero interest in the professional wrestling available in WCW. Meanwhile, those WCW fans, they did not have any interest in KISS. This was a classic lose-lose partnership. Well, not quite a lose-lose, KISS ended up winning because they pocketed half a million bucks for the whole thing. In fairness to Simmons and KISS, they did make an investment during the team's first season as they really wanted the LA KISS to have this concert-like vibe for every home game. Attendance at the Honda Center in Anaheim was good, even if it featured some really ugly uniforms and a pretty gross field. However, it cost a lot of money to keep people coming back to see a team that was just god-awful. That money was not coming the following season. The hope was that the KISS brand combined with the Arena League football product would be enough to draw fans in. Alas, it was not. Attendance dropped dramatically in the franchise's second season and the team itself just wasn't very good either. By 2016, KISS had pretty much exited the venture entirely. Sure, their brand was still on the uniforms and the team name, but they were not interested in spending any more money on this. And in reality, it was a pretty simple proposition. KISS fans didn't care about the arena football team. Arena football fans didn't care about KISS being the name of the team. The last role of the dice for the Arena Football League turned up snake eyes and the sport it was just falling further and further away from mainstream relevancy. Since first launching in the late 1980s, the Arena Football League was always seen as the sport's preeminent organization. 
Owners wanted to own teams there, players wanted to play there, and in reality, there was never really a truly viable alternative for either party. In 2009, the Intense Football League merged with the United Indoor Football League to create the Indoor Football League, or IFL. While the first few years were definitely a struggle, by 2015 it had become a fairly stable group. So much so that AFL teams actually were leaving the AFL to join the IFL. Six AFL teams would eventually jump ship to the IFL, with most of them citing the lower operational costs involved. That wasn't the only embarrassing thing for the Arena Football League during this time. Perhaps the most embarrassing example of this was the defending champion, San Jose Sabercats, closing up shop after the 2016 campaign ended. However, it's important to note that it wasn't just the IFL in the fold during this time. You had the Midwest-focused Champions Indoor Football League, which began play in 2015 after a merger. There was the National Arena League, which kicked off in 2017. Not only was retaining teams now a challenge for the Arena Football League, but so too was finding expansion sides because owners had options on where they wanted their side to play. It must be noted that all of these indoor football leagues at this time struggled from the same problems. Teams came and went, you had flaky owners who just would drop out at inopportune times or didn't have the financing. Television, any media coverage has always been hard to come by and it's just been really hard to get arena football back to a mainstream recognition. That being said, many of these leagues are still in existence. As for the AFL, well... The AFL folding wasn't a matter of if by 2017, it was a matter of when. That season, the league could only muster a paltry five teams. It got worse in 2018 when only four teams signed up to participate. More sides were added by 2019, but at this point the AFL had just become this northeast regional entity and nothing more. Arena Bowl 32 took place on August 11th, 2019 with the Albany Empire comfortably seeing off the Philadelphia Soul. The AFL was actually supposed to announce the locations of two incoming expansion franchises during the game's broadcast on ESPN2, but that never happened. Instead, the AFL filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy a few months later. There was really nothing left for it by this point. The league had gone bankrupt twice in a decade. It had done nothing but lose fans, lose teams, and lose money at an alarming rate. The king was dead, but it didn't mean the end for the sport of arena football. I stumbled across the fact you could watch CIF, NAL, and IFL games for free on YouTube sometime in 2019. What I found watching these games was a sport stripped down to its core. Players and coaches, they loved just being there and having the opportunity to be involved with football. Fans, they were just happy to support the home team. And it was a sport that had finally found a place where it could survive and maybe even thrive. While the AFL always suffered from delusions of grandeur of being this mainstream sport in major TV markets, the most successful franchises over the years were the ones that could build up a relationship with their local communities. It is why former big names from the AFL and AF2, including the Iowa Barnstormers, Arizona Rattlers, and Green Bay Blizzard, have found a way to make it work over the years. It's also why teams you have probably never heard of, like the Duke City Gladiators and the Selena Liberty, have found success as arena football franchises. My favorite fact about the Liberty is that they play in the Tony's Pizza Events Center. That is right, folks. The cheap frozen pizza company for some reason has stadium naming rights in some random venue in the middle of Kansas. 
ultimately the best arena football test cases? Well, they can be found in the two Sioux, Sioux City, Iowa, and Sioux Falls, South Dakota. For more than 20 years, each place has boasted a franchise, despite neither one ever playing in the AFL. The Sioux Falls Storm are without question the most successful team in the history of arena football. Over the years, they have won 11 league championships and they've only missed the playoffs twice in their entire franchise history. Over in Iowa, the Sioux City Bandits may not have the titles of their Sioux Falls counterparts, but it is a franchise blessed with consistency. In a sport where so many sides have come and gone in more than 35 years, these two franchises are proof arena football does work in the right environment. And that environment is not the bright lights of big cities where competition for attention is fierce. It is in the nooks and crannies of America where entertainment options are still limited to this day and local pride is traditionally strongest. That being said, success, well, it isn't as easy as showing up. Owners must invest in marketing and grassroots effort. Getting on local TV is also something that is huge. It may take a while, but once a city gets hooked on arena football, they become addicted to it. The Spokane Shock are the absolute test case, the perfect example of that. The many rises of arena football are definitely proof that the sport can work. Unfortunately, the many falls are also proof that if you try to fly too close to the sun, it's all going to come tumbling down and pretty quickly. The third incarnation of the AFL is a perfect example of the latter. Do those running it really believe they're going to cobble together a 16 team league in big cities and just have it be a huge success history has shown us a bunch of money will be thrown down the drain on this endeavor before it ultimately files for bankruptcy but hey i guess three bankruptcies and you're out the thing is the afl 3.0 it's not even the only arena football league set to launch in 2024 the Arena League will also start play as a four-team outfit being overseen by Hall of Fame wide receiver Tim Brown. For some reason, this new startup league is promising faster-paced games, despite the fact I don't think anyone has ever complained about there not being enough action in an arena football game. Have the league founders ever watched the sport? Anyway, if we're being honest, it's impossible to imagine a sporting landscape where arena football is anything more than a summertime distraction in small towns. The highs of the 2000s with its ABC broadcasts and PS2 games are long gone and they are not coming back. Now, this doesn't mean arena football is bad or needs to go away forever. On the contrary, however, I enjoy watching games from random places in America. Your Omaha's, your Sioux Falls, your Billings, Montana's, your Salina, Kansas's, these exotic destinations no one would voluntarily travel to on their own. Is exotic the right word? Arena football, well, it may not be mainstream and it may never be mainstream again, but the fact it has survived after all of these years is worth praise alone. For every 10 incompetent, bumbling fools who have failed trying to make a quick buck off the sport, there has been one person with enough vision to make it work. That is why 35 years from now, it is almost guaranteed that someone will be playing indoor or arena football in America. Gene, I am so fired up to see us finally bringing football back to Los Angeles. All the rest of the league better be ready because LA Kiss is gonna come rocking down the house and we're gonna win, you know it.